Hello folks, I'm Tim Pennell from NQA. I head up the Information Assurance Business Unit. And if we've spoken before, hello again. And to those of you I've yet to have the pleasure of meeting, welcome to today's webinar about supply chain assurance and risk management. But before we start, a quick bit about NQA, if you're not familiar with uh, NQA. We specialize in a range of management system standards for certification, which are um, currently being conducted remotely, unless a client has specific requirements. And we're a global leader in certification with offices in London, Boston, Bangalore, and uh, Shanghai. And for all of these standards, we also offer training services um, with e-learning, webinars, uh, in-house and pandemic permitting uh, at nationwide locations. Now, if you've had the opportunity to listen to any of my webinars about operation resilience, business continuity or information security, then you've probably picked up on a couple of common themes. One is risk and the second is suppliers, and in particular, knowing and managing the risks in your supply chain. But supply chain assurance done effectively is not something that all organisations do, and there are many factors to take into account, so it can be difficult to know where to start and what to do. Well, I'm delighted to introduce Dominic Owen from Tuned to Risk. Dom truly is an expert in all things supply chain assurance, and he joins me today to share his experience. We've got 45 minutes, which includes time for Q&A at the end, so please type your questions into the chat box. And as ever, uh, you'll receive a recording of the webinar and a copy of the slides. I'm going to start by setting the context and then looking at some of the factors that organisations might consider important to their supply chain and how they manage it. I'll touch briefly on some of the standards and frameworks out there. Dom takes over and he'll take you through the how to, starting with risk and finishing with supplier assurance monitoring, during which he'll flavour it with some real life examples. And then I'll finish with uh, tactical and strategic options. And then finally, of course, we'll have Q&A. Now, I'm going to apologise up front, but it's almost impossible to discuss any business matter without including the words COVID and Brexit. But it's those two well-worn words that are driving interest in overall operational resilience. And one of the fundaments of operational resilience is the supply chain, that continuous flow of raw materials and services that organisations must constantly consume. In fact, it's remarkable given everything that's going on, that there haven't been greater disruptions, particularly to logistics. In fact, we talk about frontline health and care workers and the risks they face, yet it strikes me that hauliers and delivery services are also at elevated risk as they come into contact with so many different people. Yet there has been disruption. It is now apparent how brittle some supply chains are. Business practices such as just-in-time, lean and other methods have thinned out businesses to maximum efficiency but with very little toleration for disruption. And, and they're great until a diplomatic spat combined with COVID and Brexit breaks them. Now, some of these issues include changes in customer demands behavior due to perceived issues, rightly or wrongly. And this can further manifest, manifest itself in material allocation and customer management issues. Smaller organizations might not have the leverage with large suppliers and might lose out on stock allocation. Now, in the news recently, Amazon has bought up all the cardboard boxes and there is a national shortage of cardboard. Suppliers implement new channels that organisations have difficulty adopting. Competitors might outperform them, thereby having greater access to those suppliers. And high risk contracts could be like a house of cards where they're underpinned by only a few critical suppliers. And industry research suggests there's a variety of other challenges. There's a shortage of subject matter experts to provide insights into supply chains. And these supply chains can be quite contextual. Automotive manufacturing is quite different to the services industry with more supplier tiers, global supply, raw ma more material prices and geopolitical influences. Some organisations depend on niche suppliers that they just weren't aware of. Who is supplying the raw material and all those sub-assemblies? Not all companies have a single view of their inventory. And there's a good argument to say that your inventory is not just what's on your shelves now, it's also what is next to be put on your shelves. So how far ahead do organisations look? How much is tied up in the logistics chain? And how disruptions affect operations and how will they affect liquidity? Similarly, 
if you're looking ahead in time, do you have the ability to look geographically? Where is that stock in that logistics chain? And suppliers hiding bad news, making issue, masking issues is not unheard of. We've seen in the news where companies continue to pay dividends, then all of a sudden restate their accounts due to past accounting issues. In conversations with our clients, we've seen that they've begun rethinking their far-flung far supply chains in response to changing labour costs, advances in automation, rising protectionism and external shocks, such as natural disasters. But it took the COVID-19 pandemic to more fully expose structural flaws that have prompted organisations to fundamentally reassess their approach to global manufacturing and sourcing factory lockdowns, transportation disruptions and panic buying have led to shortages of everything from medical supplies and household necessities to critical automotive and electronic components. The crisis has also heightened geopolitical tensions, trade restrictions and nationalist policies aimed at promoting domestic industry that are likely to continue reshaping the global business landscape. Through my other role as an ISO auditor, I get to talk to many organisations and it's been very interesting to see their different approaches to the current business environment. Firstly, there's been a significant increase in interest in ISO 22301, Business Continuity Management. That requires organisations to conduct a business impact analysis, which includes supplier dependencies and to conduct evaluations of partners and suppliers. Secondly, some organisations have been stocking up just in case. Not quite like panic buying toilet rolls, but they've identified key stock items and have built up reserves. One client has decided to always have 60 days worth on their shelves. What was interesting was that they didn't conduct any formal analysis, they just used their experience to decide, which is a perfectly good method. Some organisations have done nothing because it just works as is and they don't perceive any risks, which is fine for as long as it just works. Then there are those customers who are looking into it. But what I found most interesting is that there are a few customers who are also worrying upwards, that is, into their customer chain. What are the factors that affect the continued viability of their customers? Can they measure their customers' viability? And what strategies should they put in place? And how far up the chain can they, should they look? Which isn't always easy because many small suppliers only have a few customers. All this then suggests that the way organisations manage their supply chain may well be different in the brave new world. More formal, more rigorous, changing business practices to such as just-ish in time, not lean but not fat either, and greater scrutiny on contractual compliance. Just what a resilient supply chain will look like in the future will vary from sector to sector, but I think organisations will need to more closely align their supply chain to their strategic objectives and their business ethos. And there are many factors to this, but a lot will depend on the organization's drivers to change and their ability to change. A web search for supply chain assurance will return many results with cybersecurity at the top of the list. Someone new to the discipline could be forgiven for thinking it's all about cybersecurity of the supply chain. And indeed, for many organisations, information is their life, lifeblood and they exchange information over the Internet. Data protection fines and GDPR has put cybersecurity at the forefront of awareness, but it's not the only factor to be considered and it isn't necessarily the most important. As any lawyer will say when you want a straight answer, it depends. It depends on what's important to the organisation. A recent survey suggested that cyber attacks were believed to present the lowest risk to organisations. So what follows are all factors of a risk-based approach to supply chain management. These are some of the things to think about when looking at a supply chain. And let's start with ethics and morals. If an organisation truly believes in and wants to live its values, then this may apply. If it is committed to ethical sourcing, but in times of difficulty, will it be prepared to use available materials of dubious origin? This could be incredibly difficult for an organization with a USP predicated on ethics. How sensitive is it to raw material cost? And this could be a case of careful, be careful of what, what you wish for. I had a look at Apple's supplier responsible standards document. It's 90 pages of everything that Apple expects of its suppliers, such as prevention of underage labor, dormitories and dining standards for employees, the responsible source of materials. 
Apple claims to have audited over 830 suppliers in 2019, and 82% were considered high performing. And yet, sometimes the press paints a different picture. Fortunately for Apple, we consumers seem to care more about the product than who or how it was made. Another way of looking at this matter is if the organization has a competitor with significant market power, would the competitor be motivated at the expense of smaller competitors, thereby driving competition out of the market? How would you know? Fluctuations in raw material prices, currency fluctuations and energy price fluctuations hit supply chains at different levels and with varying degrees of impact. In my experience, it's the manufacturers who import raw materials who are most at risk but they experience that daily and so are the most aware and have factored it into their business models. The point is that, other than a sudden crash, these are known and to an extent controllable. Are any of your suppliers vulnerable to such fluctuations? Market changes, when what used to fly no longer does, are harder to control, although trends can be observed over time. I know of one client who suffered an issue when their main supplier stopped manufacturing an important component, switching instead to a lucrative product. Technology change can impact suppliers and customers. When new IT doesn't work with legacy kit, what are the impacts of changes you're introducing or having imposed on you? Is there a new form of electronic invoicing perhaps? And then there's unplanned tech and telecommunications outages, which tend to be short term, but depending on where they occur in the supply chain, they can have an upward snowball effect, delaying supply. Clearly then, Organizations need assurance that their suppliers have appropriate business continuity plans in place, that they work and they're resourced. But if they rely on a new te unique technology, do you then have a single point of failure? And how would you know? Stakeholders can play an important role. For example, has a supplier just been bought by an asset stripping venture capital company? Geopolitical instability has a role to play, especially if government is a, a, a stakeholder, Huawei being a case in point. Organisations are also sensitive to skill shortage. At a recent Westminster forum, the National Cyber Security Centre pointed out that there are thousands of long-term unfilled cyber security vacancies on LinkedIn, which in turn drives up salaries, making smaller organisations less attractive in the labour market, more likely to lose the very skills they need to operate. Reliance on a small supply base or a regional concentration of suppliers is akin to putting eggs in uh, a basket. Fortunately, there aren't too many examples that I can think of when a regional environmental disaster has affected a bunch of suppliers in the same market. But you can envisage it on a geopolitical basis. Now, before handing over to Dom, I want to quickly run through um, some supply chain assurance standards, which you may find relevant. There are various standards out there for supply chain assurance, some public and some mandated by authorities. This is just a sample. ISO 28000, the specification for security management systems in the supply chain, and ISO 28001, best practices for implementing supply chain security. These are management system standards like 9001 for quality and 20, 27001 for information security. So they implement a management system, but they are security specific and they're quite old, although the principles still stand. I'm not aware of any certification bodies offering certification against them, though there may be. The National Cyber Security Centre offer supply chain security guidance with 12 principles under their headings, understand the risks, establish control, check your arrangements and continuous improvement. Then the Information Security Forum or the ISF have a supply chain assurance framework, although I'm not a member, so I haven't seen it. What I do know is that all ISF products are based on member experiences, so I probably would place faith in it. The Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply offer a number of very useful resources, including supplier performance management. And the UK government has re recently produced due diligence principles for assuring labour in supply chains, which include general principles for risk-based supply chain assurance. There's also information available on government support for strengthening supply chain resilience. And of course, with the right Google search terms, there are plenty of checklists for download, often backed up with a consultant if you need them. And now, over to Don. Thanks, Tim. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, 
So before we get into the functions of supply and supplier risk management, I just wanted to spend a few minutes with you looking at the types of distress signals that can eventually lead to a company's liquidity failure. So I think there are five stages of crises, typically. Um, let's, let's cover them in turn. So the, the strategic crisis, I guess, is things like a change in ownership, um, conflict in a group of companies, high turnover of staff, loss of, loss of key people, um, perhaps outliers in a, a company strategy that could indicate that risk tolerance is out of step with the company's financial position. So what I've done here is I've kind of picked on five cases, um, the first one being Tesco. In, in that case, on the out of step uh, situation, Tesco oper used to operate five private jets um, under its former CEO, a guy called Phil Clark. And to me, that symbolized the excess and detachment of the top management. And indeed, it was a, a precursor to operational issues, uh, such as an overstatement of profits and the closure of loss-making stores. And when he took over in 2014, Dave Lewis, uh, one of, almost one of the first things he did was scrap all the jets and the team of in-house pilots, would you believe? Uh, but it took him over a year to do it. Okay. Um, stakeholder crisis for me is about declining sentiment. Um, and that could be by investors, customers, employees, analysts, um, potentially due to changes in the market or concentration risks, but also due to reputational or adverse media risks. I've used Volkswagen here because of the emission, emissions crisis known as Dieselgate, and its stock value fell by a third as a result of that um, scandal, let's say. But clearly, with, there was a huge loss of trust in that particular uh, scenario that did lead to significant operational issues and a loss of, a, a, a loss of customer um, revenue, I guess. And compensation claims are still being made over five years later. Uh, so obviously damaging, um, damaging Volkswagen's top line. For operational crises, I'm, I'm thinking of things like quality uh, issues, failed delivery times, falling demand, uh, poor sales that reflect problems at an operational level. Uh, an example here would be Uber, uh, lost its license to uh, operate in London uh, a couple of years ago after repeated safety failures that put passengers at risk. Uh, for example, suspended drivers being able to create Uber accounts and carry passengers. Uh, clearly, there was a lack of control and oversight that contributed to uh, the Mayor of London's decision to withhold that license. Uh, and you know, that has since been corrected. But it's a good example of an operational crisis. Now, the thing is, you, as you, on the right-hand side, I guess, there are two axes here. You know, one is crisis level going vertically, but the passage of time is going uh, horizontally. And, and things like strategic stakeholder and operational issues can take months to develop. Think about the financial crises, though, they happen very, very quickly. So. For example, revenue crises, you know, we're talking about adverse trends in top line and bottom line financials, um, where external factors beyond the company's control have increasing significance. So Mark Suspense is a, is a good example. It's a grocer and a fashion retailer. It's in the process of closing 100 stores by 2022. Its current financial problems can be traced back to a failed strategy of primarily in-store operations when all its customers were moving to online purchases. So again, it's the consequence of strategic decision and not being in tune with, with stakeholders. Uh, and finally, you've got the liquidity, uh, I guess the, the crises, which is obviously the most significant, where you've got financial problems spiraling, urgent measures required to preserve cash. Uh, Debenhams are uh, another large group uh, department stores here in the UK. It's, it's currently in the process of being split up and sold off. 
um, another victim of the economic downturn, but also a victim of a, con a confused sales strategy and the failure to establish a clear brand proposition for its customers. And again, failing to compete uh, with young, more affordable and probably digitally savvy brands. So I've seen similar versions of this chart out there on the internet with stakeholder and strategic crisis the other way around. And again, it's a chicken and egg argument, but the point I wanna make here is that the root causes of these early warnings are largely strategic in nature. And just to confirm what Tim said earlier, risk management should ultimately be targeted at uh, an organization's strategic objectives, uh, firstly at board level, and then you know, as it's kind of filtered down through the organization into operational objectives. Ignoring the signs of financial distress cannot be remedied because a company's obligations just become too high and cannot be paid back. And there's never enough revenue to offset the debt. So let's just look at this from a, a buy side viewpoint. Studies over the years have indicated that four out of five businesses approximately have suffered some form of supply of failure over recent years, damaging customer trust, damaging the reputation, damaging the regulatory compliance and so on. So confidence in the supply chain impacts every single one of these crisis levels. But we can't keep an eye on all of the suppliers all of the time. It'd be expensive and impractical. So what should we do? Tim, can you take me to the next slide, please? Thank you, sir. So the answer lies in establishing the operational and or strategic criticality and value of a supplier at the outset. So if you're a category manager in a procurement function, you'll be doing this already. Your approved suppliers are contracted to do business with your organization. Your preferred suppliers are doing something extra for you. It could be a niche or legacy service that's hard to substitute. It could be working on a high value program or service, possibly outsourced, uh, or some really strategic transformational long-term business partnering to take the organization forward. By establishing the value and criticality factors with stakeholders, you can position a new or existing supplier on this matrix. Again, it's based on a Kralich model. Each sector should correspond with a level of in-life management and assurance or oversight of a supplier. Due diligence pre-contract will establish a level of risk according to the supplier's capability, its reputation, its location, its ownership, its financial strength, et cetera, et cetera. You specify which risk factors are important to you. But it's always recommended to reflect these requirements in the total cost of a procurement. So a higher risk supplier offering lower cost services may not end up in the long term being cheaper than a lower risk supplier that wants to sell its services to you for slightly, slightly more. And if you're a buyer looking to sign off a deal you've made, recognizing that level of residual risk to the organization on day one is absolutely crucial. So just a reminder that residual risk is, is the inherent supply and category risk that you've been able to manage down by a mix of due diligence, contractual checks, commercial controls, and a commitment from your in-life operations to run supplier checks on a regular basis. It's really, really important and I'll mention this a few times over the next few minutes, to establish operational ownership on things like SLAs prior to the supplier contract handover, and also not to overlook tier two and beyond of the supply chain. So if you're in a category, for example, clothing, where you know, it's been prone over the years to modern slavery abuses, perhaps power, where you've got battery supplies, where you know there's been adverse media around quality control, around dumping, categories with really complex supply chains. Operational owners may not be confident offsetting all of that risk onto the first tier to manage. Okay, so let's get into the actual risk management cycle. What do we need to think about once a supplier has been onboarded? Kim, Tim, can you take me to the next slide, please? So there's various approaches here to, to assessing risk. At a very basic level, you may go for just a high, medium, low, or a traffic light, red, amber, green approach, just based on gut feel. At an intermediate level, maybe a more qualitative approach, 
maybe using a, a matrix considering the scale of impact and the likelihood of something happening. As people get more skilled at evaluating risk, the next step is turning those qualifications into real financial values. And as you, as you get to really mature organizations, they're using statistical analysis and big data to run scenario planning. So things like Mon Monte Carlo analysis. But what should we all be thinking about? And I've listed some things here. So you've identified a risk, for example, that a failure of a quality control check could lead to material scrappage rates, high material scrappage rates. So here's a set of questions you may want to ask yourself. What's the potential impact of that risk scenario materializing? What's the likelihood of that risk materializing? How quickly could that risk materialize? What checks do we have in place to predict the risk, detect the risk or correct the risk? Are those checks effective? Or do we have a gap? So here I'm referring to the evaluate step where we're thinking about the difference between our current controls, which is our net risk. So this is this is the residual risk I was referring to earlier. Our desired controls, which is the target risk, or what our stakeholders have told us the risk they can tolerate, and the gaps, which is our gross risk or the inherent risk. So Again, to carry on asking the questions, you know, have the key risk indicators or the early warning systems been exceeded? Do we need to escalate? Again, going back to the tolerance, what, what is my operational owner's tolerance for the current level of risk exposure against their planned objectives? Could they cope with some temporary disruption? I know it's an awful lot to think about, but ultimately, Risk is about recommending a course of action that can be agreed, planned, implemented, and monitored. Okay, so the subject of this session was supply chain assurance. So this next slide is all about that. Can you take me there, please, Tim? Thank you. So the question is, how do you know if the risk controls you've put in place to monitor and manage supplier risk are being carried out and are effective? So this diagram, I use it all the time. It's a really good example of an assurance approach. It's called three lines. And the idea is that you separate responsibilities for controlling and assuring a risk across three lines of defense. So the first line is always operational management. They're responsible for carrying out the risk checks and the line management is responsible for making sure those checks are being carried out. The second line is typically made up of specialists that support the first line through guidance and support, but they also want to do some oversight themselves. So people, I'm thinking people like risk managers, security managers, data privacy officers, the ethics officer, and so on. Those type of people own policies for the organization and they wanna know that people in their organization are following those policies and the, the checks and balances that they've specified in those policies are being undertaken and are effective. And then, and then third line, you've got uh, internal audit. And what internal audit is doing is looking across both first and second lines to check that they're joined up, they're talking to each other, and they are operating efficiently. Audit will typically report to the board, uh, shown here as the governing body, on the effectiveness of risk management practices. So depending on the nature of the business, effect, uh, evidence may need to be submitted to um, an external assurance provider uh, to maintain a certifi certification. And Tim took you through some examples of those earlier, or perhaps an external regulator to ensure compliance with the law. Now, there are some important elements to assurance and I've listed some here. I'm not going to go through them line by line, but if I could just pick on one to emphasize, it's the last one. Without accountability for risk, no matter whether it's a risk at a project level, a program level, a business unit level, or a company-wide level, your risk strategy, your risk framework, your risk program will not succeed. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to hand you back to Tim to wrap the presentation section up of this webinar.
Uh, Tim's going to discuss some tactical and medium term solutions to the challenges that I've listed on these last few slides. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Dom. But these are the things that can be done tactically as part of the governance framework described by Dom and then uh, longer term strategic plans, which is where I'll start. I'm drawing heavily on a PwC report here, but the big four have all produced similar analysis, as have others, and their findings are borne out by my conversations with many of NQA's clients. And interestingly, they were mostly during ISO 9001 quality audits. And, and, and the first one that is standing out is to create and implement a business continuity plan, which, as I mentioned earlier, draws out suppliers. Of course, we'd then like you to have NQA to come in and certify you to ISO 22301. Then there's reviewing the sourcing strategy with a view to diversification. I often audit clients with a single supplier. I understand why. It just works. Um, so if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And trust is an important thing. But really, is it preparing to fail? At least conduct a review of that supplier. Really importantly, increase supplier conversations, first and second tier, and encourage those suppliers to collaborate as well, discussing business continuity, for example. And consider component substitution and increasing stock levels and forward buying, as we've already mentioned. Then there's nearshoring and onshoring manufacturing or services, if it's affordable though, um, and ideally with regional spread. And as previously discussed, potentially you could stockpile. Some organisations are postponing or delaying plans until business conditions improve, which I think is quite prevalent, prevalent during the pandemic. But tactically, when placing a lens over your suppliers, there are quite a few things you can do. Dom's already mentioned it, but first principles mean a contract must be in place to which the supplier can be held to account. Does the contract contain performance criteria or standards which you want them to meet and against which you can measure them or they can periodically report? In particular, only procuring with suppliers who are certified to ISO standards is highly recommended. This isn't sales pitch, it's just uh, a massive peace of mind that organisations certified to relevant standards are in a really good place. Note that terminology is important here. Some contracts state that an organisation must be compliant with a standard, not certified to it. And that's a massive difference. Any organisation can claim to be compliant, but a certified organisation proves it year after year without you having to do anything. The important thing to do is to check the supplier certification is relevant to whatever you procure. If, say, a 9001 quality certificate is in place for a particular site, but you buy products manufactured at a different site not covered by the certificate, then it's not relevant. Supplier questionnaires are very popular, but frequently used ineffectively. How many of you have received a boilerplate questionnaire containing many lines of irrelevant questions, which you then completed, probably thinking that no one is really going to look at what you've written? Dom discussed supplier segmentation, which will help you decide where to focus your efforts. So when you do, ensure that if you employ questionnaires, they will give answers to the really important questions. This could mean tailoring um, each questionnaire to each supplier and whatever they provide. Now, whilst that might sound like an admin burden, if you're taking a risk-based approach, then you're targeting suppliers where they really matter. And asking sensible questions, then following them up, helps improve the relationship with your suppliers. Conducting your own audits is the gold-plated solution. You'll need to have it specified in the contract in advance, though. It also requires a certain expertise on your part. Or alternatively, you can engage a third-party expert in that field, and that's important. A medical devices expert will not be as effective uh, conducting an audit of a motor manufacturer. Audits are also disruptive and can be sensitive. Some suppliers just won't entertain customer audits, particularly if the supplier is, say, one of the big tech companies like Amazon or Microsoft. Audits must be carefully planned in order to obtain information only about the things that matter. But bear in mind that audit findings are only as current at the point at which they were observed. They can quickly go out of date. Market watch or research is a useful method of gathering information about a supplier without even going near them. This may well be a tendering activity anyway, but it's good practice to periodically carry this out. Knowing the public track record of suppliers, including things like their published accounts, can provide a degree of assurance. It's worth talking about overall governance, the framework within which supply chain management takes place. Even if you're not certified to an ISO standard, I highly recommend the plan, do, check, act cycle. It's a tried and tested method of continuous improvement. 
I'm also a big fan of heat maps. You may well have heard me say in previous webinars how in my experience top management don't like the colour red. So if you've performed a bunch of checks on some suppliers, rate their performance in a heat map and you'll soon get the CEO's attention. I've also produced a quick method for measuring operation resilience, which will soon be available for download from the NQA website. It's very easily adapted for doing the same to the supply chain. OK, now, before we go on to uh, Q&A, just a couple of reminders, if you weren't already aware. First of all, uh, NQA has some very good COVID tools and resources. Please go to our website for some more information there. And there are excellent free implementation guides for the management system standards, again, on NQA's website. So thank you very much indeed. I'm now going to open this um, up to questions. Uh, let me just bring up the chat box here and we'll have a look and see uh, not the, sorry, the uh, questions. There we go. Let's have a look. OK. Um, OK, no questions um, so far. Don't forget you've got uh, Dom and I here to answer any questions uh, you may have. We'll be very pleased to answer them. Tim, while we're waiting for questions, you might want to whet my appetite, and I don't know about the audience, about the operational resilience um, guide that you were uh, you're going to be publishing soon. Yes, that's indeed. Something that's quite close to, to my heart, actually, because I think risk and resilience are very, very closely connected. Mm, indeed. Yeah, well, we, I ran a, a webinar on operational resilience. And, and one of the issues there is how do you measure your organization's operation resilience? Because it comprises a number of factors and there are various ways of doing this. And one of the easiest ways of doing this is, is for want of a better phrase, a committee of wise men where you sit down and, and use your opinion on how well you think something is performing. So you split your organization out into a, a set of functions and then using what knowledge you have, so that your, your committee of wise men are drawn from those different parts of the organization and you rate them give them um, a score and the idea is that these functions are all given a weighting because clearly some functions are more important to others depending on on the organization and your your risk appetite and that eventually flows up to give yourself an overall score for, for the organization but it draws out those parts of the organization which are better performing or, or lower performing and you can plot that in a nice colored heat map as, as well but the point is it's simply a method whereby you apply a weighting to something and then to, to various things and then give them scores and you can easily adapt that method for pretty much anything you want to do uh, i had quite a bit of feedback when i gave the operation resilience webinar for people asking for that um because i presented it on screen um uh, and yeah it will be made available it's completely unscientific it's simple but the point is if it's done by the same people it becomes repeatable and so you can monitor your um uh, uh, performance, if you like, operational resilience performance over time, or whatever you choose to um, measure using using the tool. That helps, Thank you. I definitely look forward to seeing that. Well, it's a little bit quiet on the, uh, the we Q have a question. Front. We have a question, Don. Oh, excellent. Super. It's from Tom Harris. I'll read it out. You spoke briefly about single sourcing and trusting and investing in suppliers, which used to be a well thought of Japanese strategy. Is it still used? And how is it doing with current crises, pressure on supply chain risk? Mm. Do you want me to take that one? Yeah, please, far away. Um, so just to differentiate single sourcing from sole sourcing. So single sourcing is, a, is, a, is an actual category strategy, whereas sole sourcing is there are no substitutes in the market that you want to purchase from. Again, it, it, it depends on what your objectives are. Single sourcing has a risk, obviously, in that if the supplier fails, uh, the ability to substitute is uh, either limited or, or almost non-existent, or could take some time or could be very expensive for the organization. But they could be doing something that nobody else does. So the, the, I think the issue with uh, increasing over the years is that companies want to um, 
create a unique selling proposition for themselves. They want to create that uniqueness. It's very attractive to the marketplace. But the downside of doing that is that if you want to deliver something to the market and you're using a supplier that has some key skills, it creates a dependency. Um, so unless you're working really in partnership with that supplier and you, you know, there's a two-way relationship, there is mutual support um, and recognition, then to me, single sourcing creates a risk that is probably above tolerance in most cases. So again, really important. Do you want to add to anything to that, Tim? Well, I just want to, uh, Tom's uh, question is, is it still used and how is it doing with the current crisis? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's absolutely still used. I think, you know, in the current crises that people are thinking about where, um, you know, as we, were, as we work through Brexit and as we're working through the pandemic now, people are thinking, where, where are my uh, niche dependencies? Do I need to put some business continuity plans in place? I did some work earlier year in the, uh, last year at uh, clients in London uh, as we were working through that pandemic work stream and we did identify quite a number of key dependencies. Again, you're not talking about being able to substitute these overnight. Some of them were taking six, nine, 12 months. Um, and again, it's that kind of timescales that we're talking about. So absolutely, yes, they are still in place. They're being used. A lot of them are very hard to substitute. You're talking about long-term substitution. Um, most companies that I've talked to would prefer to work their way through any risks that arise rather than a uh, kind of knee-jerk reaction to getting a, a second source in, which in a lot of cases is very difficult, uh, or actually, you know, changing the product line or service service line altogether. But again, you know, just to go back to the 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 point that Tim made earlier about business continuity. Um, the two go hand in hand, risk and BCM, particularly with those uh, niche dependencies, particularly with concentration risks, particularly with strategic supply, really important. Okay, thanks for that, Don. We don't have, oh no, we've got one just popped in, Stephen, Stephen Singer, just, just before the bell. Was interested in your mention of ISO 28000. A quick Google shows the current issue of the standard is 2007, so it's pre annex SL, but there is a DIS currently under development. BSI appear to offer certification. Any, any interest in NQA looking into the same? Well, thank you, Stephen. The answer is, is yes, subject to demand. Now you've mentioned that, I will take it away and, and have a look at that, that in further detail. But you're right, it is pre annex SL, which is a shame because annex SL does offer that common standard, particularly for integrated management systems. Um, so uh, I suppose a question for you, Stephen, would you be interested in it? <laughs> Maybe we should stay in touch. Uh, and, and as ever, you can always get in touch with myself or Dom um, via LinkedIn. So, uh, and Tom, so cyber attack risk, really not such a worry in the supply chain. Now, that's, that's not worth saying. It is very much a worry. In part, it depends on um, what, uh, is, what services are being supplied within that supply chain. And, and, and in particular, whether or not elements of that supply chain are an attractive or worthwhile target for, some, for, for these organizations that, 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 that do this. The survey that I've seen is that in terms of the things that many organizations worry about, cyber is is not at the top of their list and in, in some cases it is really is quite a uh, a bit lower but it will always be a risk particularly um for information uh, services type organizations and then angelo angelo skangas has said how much do you rely on ISO, iso certification for the effectiveness of their supply controls uh iso certification can be excellent an excellent way of um uh, drawing comfort from the effectiveness of a supplier's controls. They're having a um, third party independent stand uh, audit on their controls, which are typically recognized as industry best practice. So, um, and Dom, I'm going to ask you to jump in here in a second on this. Typically, where organizations have got an ISO certification in place, that is a big tick in the box, usually in any uh, procurement exercise. <clears throat> 
Tom, do you want to um, add to that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But there's a couple of things just to look out for, I think. The, fir the first thing is, particularly with the large organisations, is that certificates may only, uh, certificates may, may only cover a proportion of that organisation, particular business unit. So again, you have to question a supplier that's claiming to have such and such an ISO, whether it, uh, it covers a whole enterprise. And again, set the second point for me is, uh, kind of the certification is a, is a measure of the what, what you're looking for as well as a measure of the how. So things like capability maturity standards uh, are really important in my view, because the maturity in which a, an organization manages its processes and a, a, a bit like what I showed you earlier, everybody becomes a risk manager. Um, the assurance that a supplier can give a customer uh, is, you know, cannot be underestimated. So again, I think it's a mix of those accreditations, but, you know, if I'm in procurement and I'm running a tender, it, it would give me a comfort, but again, it has to be accompanied with something else that says, that's great, that's the what, but, you know, what, can you give me some assurance on the how? You know, how mature is your organization in managing risk and compliance, for example? In fact, I'll just add to that, Tom. So this is not about an ISO certification, but there's a new American standard coming out from the US Department of Defense called CMMC. And that looks at two things. One are a set of information security controls, NIST 800-171 controls. But in parallel to that, it also looks at the maturity of uh, uh, the organization and the implementation and governance and the embeddedness, if you like, of those controls as well. So building on Dom's point, um, very much so. Uh, it is a mix of those things. And we have um, Tom, um, he said, um, thanks for the supply. It makes sense, attractiveness of given supply as a cyber attack target. But then what was, okay, cyber skills shortage. Yeah, there is <laughs> there is a, a big issue, um, and I, I, certainly in the UK, and I suspect globally as well, that there aren't enough uh, people with the right um, cybersecurity uh, skills to help defend UK PLC. Um, it, it it is a problem and it's a risk that organisations have to take into account. But it, again, it depends whether or not they're an attractive target and, and the extent to which they're prepared to invest in in cyber, depending on how they perceive that, that risk. Okay. Right, I think we, we, we've overrun slide by three minutes, but that's great. We've had some very good questions. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, as a reminder, you will be receiving a copy of this um, webinar. It'll also be available for um, download on the NQA website. So I'd like to finish in particular by thanking Dom Owen from Tune to Risk for coming on and his really experienced and valuable in insight. And we look forward to working with you again, Dom. And once again, everybody, thank you very much and goodbye. Thank <laughs> you.